plan. You, you're angry? You start shooting! I'm angry! I have never been this angry in my entire life! Sometimes it seems as if by divine providence, hilarious and beautiful videos fall into your lap in a conjunction of potential social science theory, like manna falling from heaven. And that's what happened over this last week. And although you've probably seen some of these videos shared by other commentators online, I want to share them with you as well, and then try desperately to explain what we all just watched using communication, social science, and sociology research. So strap in friends, and let's start the show. We're not doing credit. You're gonna give me my fucking money back. Excuse me, sir, there's a young man in here. And you want to know. Know. Excuse me, it's ma'am. It is ma'am. I can call the police if you'd like me to. You need to settle down. You need to settle down and mind your business, okay? Ma'am, once again, ma'am. I said both of you. No, you said sir. Once again, it's ma'am. I actually said both of you guys. It was a general. Right beforehand, you fucking said sir. Sir? Okay. Motherfucker, take it outside! If you want to call me sir again, I will show you a fucking sir! Okay, well, this first interesting clip comes from a transgender woman who was shopping at a GameStop, trying to buy, I'm guessing, a teller to Tori when the spaghetti began to spill uncontrollably out of her pockets. I mean, we've all been there once or twice before now, haven't we? She claims, and notice how sensitive I'm being, by the way, here, but she claims that the cashier called her sir, while the cashier himself claims you guys. I'm sorry, I called him a cashier, a male. I don't know his pronouns either. And by the way, neither do you, lady. But as a result, she, and I'm using some clinical terminology here, flips her proverbial, or actual, wig. She becomes so irate over this, at best, slip-up. Although he does appear to call her sir again, I think he's kind of trying to defend himself, and I'm not really sure what's going on. She's also being highly confrontational and just kind of being a jerk. So I can't really say that this guy is in the wrong here, nor can I properly hear what's going on. All I know is that she claims that the cashier called her sir, and he said that all he said was you guys. So, who knows? Excuse me, sir, there's a young man in here. Okay? Man. But the point is, she ends up screeching at this minimum wage GameStop employee who is likely to be fired, and yes, he is most likely a minimum wage employee, considering that they, at least as far as I've heard, always have a massive stack of applications and resumes sitting on their desk because so many young people in high school and college think that working at GameStop will allow them to work with video games, when really it just allowed you to enter the incredibly hopeless and sad reality that is retail work. What I'm talking about is the fact that when you get hired at GameStop, it's not like getting hired at a movie theater or really any other part-time job. You're going to start with probably three to six hours a week. Three to six hours a week. And that's if you get any hours that week at all. Worse yet is the way that they've managed to make this call-up system work. It's almost like minor league baseball, where if you answer the phone on their call, you're more likely to get those extra hours and vice versa. Now, you could argue this is everywhere. The difference between this place and everywhere else is when you start at three to six hours, you have to have another job to sustain yourself. I've done it. Probably you've done it. It's not a fun time. Yet, as far as I can tell, this employee really did nothing wrong. In contrast, she seems to think that he committed nigh a hate crime. How could their two perceptions be so different? Even if he did accidentally call her sir, something which, come on, was probably just an honest communication error given most of his customers are, statistically speaking, men, is not really a big deal unless you're an overly sensitive twat. It's also just not abnormal. I mean, I'm sure several of you have had or experienced the classic U2 at a movie theater where an employee tells you to enjoy your film. Or even worse, have you ever been on the phone with someone and then accidentally said, I love you as you hang up? Even if it's a stranger, that's because it's an autonomic response. Uh, I'll see you later. Alright, bye. Love you. It's very possible he just said sir on accident if he did it all and there's no evidence that he even did. The point is, in the way that our brains work, these are basically just scripted responses that really mean nothing in terms of actual meaning. It's just an autonomic or automatic response to stimuli. 
Yet for some reason, this simple error, if the error occurred at all, quickly devolved into some kind of perceived decimation of this person's identity, and in terms of decimation, also turned into the destruction of several innocent little displays. Surely of pop vinyl figures and other completely worthless garbage that you would find at your typical GameStop. And I'm sure that this delicate little flower will have started cutting her hair into a reverse bob so she can get that let me talk to your manager look if she hasn't already begun. Apparently she has, so we'll see how that turns out. Can I speak to the manager? I'd like to speak to the manager. Can I speak to the manager? Who's in charge here? <laughs> I mean, after all, the trans community reports having been seriously offended and affected, and thereby threatened to destroy the career of a black comedian just because he watched this video while drinking a soda pop and laughing about it. You're going to lose money over this. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, girl, ba, you are a boy, Trevor. You are a boy. You're going to refer to me as a ma'am. You sound like a strong woman. <laughs> yeah, that's how you know this is serious. So much for solidarity. Oh, also on that note, I should point out that our good friend Tariq Nasheed even said that this was ridiculous. <laughs> But really, to just make my New Year's truly special, this was not the only example that came out over the last week of some fairly extreme behavior going on in public spaces, particularly in stores, as we have this clip. Because <laughs> I just want to purchase something for Fuck off, store. dude! Fuck off! Get the fuck off of here, man! Fuck, man! Fucking stay! Fucking here! Stay, you racist motherfuckers! Racist? Yeah! Mister? Right? I'm not a racist. Right, I, got, I got a fucker in my store. He won't leave. He's wearing some Trump. He's wearing some Trump bullshit. Got some racist bullshit off his head and shit. I'd like to purchase some of this naked vape juice, though. If that would be all right. Fuck. All right. See, so because okay, leave, here's where we're at. Leave the store. Here's where you're at. Leave the store. Here's leave where, the store. Here's where leave we're at. Leave the here. store. Fuck off. I don't give a fuck. Get. Dude, go ahead, take another swing at it. Make contact with me one more time. This was apparently recorded at the store wherein a fairly close friend of mine bought his first vaporizer, which makes this extra personal. But regardless, here is the quick bog pill, the breakdown on this. This man walked into a vaporizer shop to get his vape nation while wearing a Trump t-shirt and a knockoff MAGA hat. And I mean, come on friend, it's not an official Trump hat. What the heck are you doing, freaking communist? And the cashier reacts completely rationally by screeching like an abomination. He's standing here waiting for you to ring him up. How fucking get his ass oh, Help your customer! Fuck off! Fuck off! Ah! You know, as you do. Now I'll admit that this guy here is really more aggressive than he should have been in this instance. Do my bidding. And it is completely within the employee's right to call the police if he thinks that the guy is disrupting his business and wants him off the property. That is his right. Even if he doesn't own the business, he's allowed to do that. I have defended the rights of business owners to do this in the past. The problem is that uh, he kind of loses his mind. <laughs> Now, I showed a clip and made a video earlier this year on the owner of a gun shop similarly recording an Antifa member who came in and took a bunch of free Bibles and started tearing them apart and ripping them open and throwing them up in the store and against the window and the glass of the gun shop after they were asked politely to leave. And I would say I stand behind the right of both store workers. However, one guy was the owner of the store and the other was just an employee. If someone's being disruptive, you should be allowed to ask them to leave your shop, much as was the case with Starbucks earlier this year as well, with the Starbucks manager asking two black men to leave when they were not purchasing anything after they had been asked to do so. I think that all of these cases are similarly equal. If this person didn't like the guy and wanted him to leave, that's within their prerogative. Again, the only reason that this really stands out is because they start to screech like a Bloodborne character. 
And that's really at odds with what I've seen coming from the right. Although, certainly, there is possibility for both sides to act highly irrationally. My question is, why is this happening, though? Why do we keep finding videos like this, and what causes this kind of vitriolic and incredibly aggressive emotional response? This seemingly uncontrollable hatred? How else could you describe what this guy is saying other than hatred, after all? Show it to me, I no! If you show it to me, I will Look, if you- Well, today, I will put forward and suggest that it may be part of a result of a fundamental attribution error, or what I will describe in the rest of the video as the FAE. The FAE was first posited by Ross in 1977, who described it as, quote, the tendency for attributions to underestimate the impact of situational factors and to overestimate the role of dispositional factors in controlling behavior. Page 183. What that means is that we all tend to ascribe negatively valenced behaviors or personal attributes or dispositions to others rather than ourselves, while the same behaviors and outcomes we would normally ascribe to external or situational outcomes when it comes to self-perception. Let's put it this way. When Bob is late for work, it's because he's a lazy asshole. But when I'm late for work, it's because, I mean, there was traffic. I, I, I had a cold. I, I had a weird tummy ache. I had an emergency phone call I had to take. It's not my fault. It's it, it's the fault of the environment. But Bob, Bob's a lazy jerk. So today, we're going to cover the idea of the FAE and see if that theory might help us explain why so many people are freaking out to such an extreme degree over seemingly nothing. Is it potentially because they think that there is something fundamentally, intrinsically, inherently evil and wrong about the individuals with which they are interacting as a function of that theory? Or is it something else? Let's dig into some of the data and research on the FAE and see if we can maybe find some answers to these questions. First of all, there's been plenty of research on this theory. As I said, it was posited in the late 1970s, and because of its dated age, it means that some of the research we're going to cover today, much as when we covered reactants, will be a bit dated. Still, I would argue that unless there's really good reason to believe that a study would not be replicated today, I think that these older studies are still worth looking at. We'll also be looking at a lot of recent ones, so it evens out, I think. Let's begin, then, by looking at the very concept of internality and how it is perceived. We want people to take responsibility for their actions, right? Or at least, we sometimes do, I suppose. We don't want anyone to take responsibility for a teenager being hit in the head with a bike lock because that wouldn't be fair. But other times, yes, generally speaking, we want people to take responsibility for their actions and the data do support that. So given that fundamental attribution error is a misattribution wherein people are given responsibility for things that they're not responsible for, let's look more into how we perceive responsibility. Jellian and Green, 1981, found that people tended to most positively evaluate others who socially express greater internality, meaning that they are in control of their actions, for their beliefs and emotions, rather than those who tended to externalize said aspects as outside of their personal control. As I said, we like people more when they take responsibility for themselves. Further, people generally viewed themselves as having a greater internal locus of control than others have locus of control. In other words, this study kind of provides evidence for the FAE in general. Most people do experience at some point some level of the FAE, thinking that any failure of yourself is due to some sort of external circumstance, while any failure of another person is due to a fact and reality of their personality and existence. Specifically, they reported internal ratings of locus of control at a mean of 13.1 for the self compared to 8.22 for others. That means that yes, we like people more when we think that they take more responsibility for their actions, but we also tend to overestimate ourselves as taking personal responsibility because <laughs> no duh we do. We all want to be good people outside of, you know, sociopaths. But surely that doesn't apply to the people in these videos. No, they are good people. There's no way they could be jerks in any way. I mean, this guy misgendered a trans woman maybe, and another one of them had the audacity to support the current US president. That's clearly an internal fault of their personality. Not an accident, not a slip-up, not really a problem of your perception more than their behavior. Unfreaking believable Obviously, this is only about discrimination, gosh darn it. Particularly in the vape shop case. We're not talking about someone personally offended, but someone personally offended for somebody else. Um 
He's so, a treasonous I've, asshole. I don't have I'm a problem with you, sir. Do whatsoever. I don't. I just want good health care for my kids. I don't have a problem with the color of your skin or yours. So let's look more into discrimination, particularly purported discrimination claimed for by others and its associates with the fundamental attribution error. Eliza and Major 2011 found that people had a more negative opinion towards both men and women who expressed concerns about discrimination in the place of another. In other words, being offended for somebody else. The study presented participants across multiple experimental conditions with a scenario wherein a woman was denied a scholarship for law school and told that the reason for which was because she was not assertive enough and that this was typical of women. Then, a bystander, either a male or female co-worker, stated in response that the reason for her rejection was sexist. In the control condition, the co-worker merely expressed sympathy, saying it was too bad that she didn't get the position. Both men and women who acted offended on behalf of others were uniquely more negatively perceived of by participants. Further, it was found that this effect was impacted by what they called status-justifying beliefs. Those being that the Western world is generally meritocratic and denying the concept of an overwhelming patriarchal society which is unfair towards women. Meaning that if you didn't think that a patriarchy existed, you bought into this status-justifying belief. As such, the researchers suggested that women who expressed external outrage for other women were less positively perceived of than men because they threatened the idea of a fair society more so than did their male counterparts. However, it could also be possible that the participants just believed that women were more erroneously likely to claim discrimination than men. Again, though, this is from 2011, before the age of the soy boy, uh, so I'd like to see it reconducted, including that sort of element of the male feminist. It could also be a product of the fact that sexism was the operative variable here, rather than racism or any other type of discrimination, in that participants may think women are more likely to stick up for other women, and thusly be more prone towards misattribution of sexism when there was none, and when merit was the more important variable. Again, I'd like to see this study conducted in a little bit more detail, with a few more variables included. Give me that complex design. You may think, well, Aiden, it's just because social justice warriors are angry all the time. That's why they experience this FAE. That's why they're always so fired up. They're just enraged constantly. But Forga 1998 reported that people who were happier in general, or at least in a better mood, were more likely to attribute the statements of a person to a dispositional belief rather than a circumstantial or argumentative one. In that study, participants were asked to report on how strongly they felt the writer of an article believed in a concept that they were talking about, in this case being an argument for or against nuclear testing in Australia. They found that people who were happier after having been told that they performed well on a test were more likely to view others as possessing internalized beliefs about nuclear testing affecting their writing than those who received a negative report on their performance. This may present some evidence that contradicts much of what we've discussed so far. However, it is important to note as perhaps people who are feeling good about themselves are more likely to perceive others as being inherently flawed. And what is social justice more or less all about? Feeling good about yourself all the time, often for no valid reason. It may also be possible that feeling highly supported by society, as operationalized in this study through being praised for your academic work, increases expression of the FAE. In other words, if society tells you that you're the shit, colloquially speaking, you're more likely to think that others' failures or even errors are due more to their internal disposition rather than circumstances of their environments or just making a simple mistake. And as such, let's look at accountability. Tetluck 1985 looked at the importance of accountability on perceptions of the FAE and found that people were most likely to infer a dispositional inference and difference when there was both no personal accountability for one's reaction and when the encounter was not selected personally, meaning you didn't get to pick what kind of thing you wanted to do in this study. That means that people who were told they were anonymous would suffer no recompense for describing another person as unlikable, and when they had no choice in selection. Under this instance, they were specifically more likely to trash talk the person they were assessing. In other words, the FAE only occurred in any significant degree when participants did not expect to be asked to justify their reports when they were put into any kind of standard of being held accountable for their actions or statements. Well... Where do you think we are? 
Does this person you think expect to be held to any kind of standard when they are calling someone a transphobe? Or does this person, when they screech, calling this dude a racist for wearing a Trump shirt? Or do they maybe feel emboldened, knowing that our society currently allows for no real recourse for those accused of having committed a thought crime? Various organizations have continued to include, for example, reported anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic hate crimes that were proven to be self-perpetuated hoaxes as legitimate after months months being indicated as false because somehow they still indicate racism or sexism or transphobia or whatever somehow, and with very little to no blowback from those accused. Thus, is there really any fear for people to scream at a GameStop employee, a minimum wage guy who they know will lose his job at the drop of a dime? Or for a vape shop employee to scream at his customer because he knows we'll end up going viral and expects people to be on his side? If there is no accountability, well then it seems that perceptions of the other as deserving of their fate because something about their disposition about their person is fundamentally, intrinsically, inherently hate Hateful, is then, arguably, from their position, also moralistic. It is possible, however, that those who see hate everywhere are also more able to perceive of it accurately when hate does in fact occur. In a test of the Boy Who Cried Wolf effect, O'Sullivan, 2003, found that people who are more capable of accurately identifying liars were also more likely to distrust a person who they believed was a liar. That sounds kind of obvious, but when testing for disposition error, it's not always in a negative direction. In other words, people who scored higher on determining whether or not someone was lying also tended to view that person as deceptive, and thus by definition, were less affected by any form of the FAE. That being that they accurately determined if someone was lying. It could be possible then that people who are more likely to identify someone as a bigot and castigate them as such because they actually are a bigot are in the right, potentially. However, there are some confounds that describe why we may believe someone to be more or less deceitful or bigoted. Considering that the most accurate perceivers of lies were also most likely to perceive all people as being untrustworthy, even accounting for the potential of the halo effect of positive influence, it may be that this finding is really just a measurement of accuracy of deception detection, so much as it is a measurement of social cynicism. Cynicism as a trait or as an aspect of personality is commonly linked to Machiavellianism, one of the dark triad personality traits, which itself is strongly related in a negative direction to conscientiousness, the big five personality trait itself most frequently related to conservatism and right-leaning ideology, as illustrated here in data from Rothman 2012. Now hang on, this is a bunch of stretches of correlations upon correlations upon correlations, but given that high Machiavellian people tend to be heavily cynical and also low in conscientiousness, it may be that people who lean further to the left may be more prone to cynicism and distrust of others. This is again a mere postulate based on a series of probable correlations and needs more thorough investigation, particularly as it correlates and involves the fundamental attribution error. Why I'm bringing up so many of these potential confounds, additional variables, and possibilities related to what may lead to the FAE is because there has been a long-held hypothesis posited by Pettigrew 1979 in what he called the ultimate attribution error that may have a lot to do with these instances we've been looking at today and over the last couple of years, with such seemingly irrational responses in the public due to perceptions of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, whatever phobia you feel like including there. Pettigrew, based on the work of Allport, 1954, in The Nature of Prejudice, a book I've mentioned many times and which described how black and white US soldiers during the Second World War came to cease intergroup conflict and instead came to form relationships based on their shared social groups, such as Americanism or soldier status. But based on this book and this research, contact between groups potentially leads to a change in attribution of positive or negative traits towards the outgroup. Before contact, you may have certain beliefs that were dispositional about the outgroup, and then following contact, those dispositional beliefs may change. Thereby, Pettigrew proposed the ultimate attribution error as defined by two general tendencies. One, when prejudiced people perceive what they regard of as a negative act by an outgroup member, they will more than others attribute it dispositionally, often as genetically determined, 
in comparison to the same act by an in-group member. And two, when prejudiced people perceive what they regard as a positive act by an out-group member, they will more than others attribute it in comparison to the same act by an in-group member to one or more of the following. A, the exceptional case. B, luck or special advantage. C, high motivation and effort. Or D, manipulable situational context. In other words, Pettigrew was suggesting that attribution error may be more likely and more powerful in people who perceive themselves as being disenfranchised or discriminated against. Believing that any good from their own group is due to the group's good, any good from an outgroup is due to the inherent nature of the outgroup as bad, and generally anticipating members of the outgroup to be jerks, more or less. Thus, these people may seek out examples of bad behavior from the outgroup, and in contrast, may devalue positive experiences that they have with outgroup members as mere acts of coincidence or random chance. If this is accurate, then, it may make sense why people who think they are oppressed are more likely to react sort of violently, as they have in the examples we've seen today, because they perceive a dispositional, inherent problem in others. Rather than thinking that a cashier merely misspoke by calling you sir, which, by the way, that's how shit works in the hyper-futuristic, progressive world of Star Trek. Gentlemen, welcome aboard Voyager. Thank you, sir. Mr. Kim, at ease before you sprain something. Ensign, despite Starfleet protocol, I don't like being addressed as sir. I'm sorry, ma'am. Ma'am is acceptable in a crunch, but I prefer captain. Or conversely, why a cashier may become irrationally irate because a customer was wearing a Trump shirt that they are somehow anticipating a dispositional animosity on the part of the other, the outgroup, that just necessarily wasn't the case, and reacted in outrage erroneously. But that's just a theory, right? A social science theory. Well, 20 years later, Hawthorne 1990 reviewed 19 studies of which had directly or indirectly assessed the concept of the ultimate attribution error and found some support for each of the assertions of Pettigrew. Generally speaking, the major findings of this meta-analysis forwarded the following. 1. More internal attribution for positive acts and less internal attribution for negative acts by the in-group than from out-group members. That means that as Pettigrew anticipated, in-group members tend to think that positive behavior was related to something inherent to fellow in-group members, while negative behaviors of their group were not a part of their disposition, it was just an accident. Interestingly, there was generally similar dispositional attribution for negative and positive acts by an out-group member. Thus, it is more that my group can do no wrong and is neither better nor worse based on their individual dispositions, while any out-group is inherently dislikable no matter what they do. They're all crap. Two, more attributions of outgroup than in-group failure to lack of ability and explaining away outgroup success to good luck, high effort, or easy tasks. That is, there was a propensity for outgroup failures to be perceived of as a problem of the outgroup member being intrinsically less apt than in-group members, and when they did succeed, it was due to luck or happenstance, external influence. Interestingly enough, given we're talking about the fundamental attribution error. Finally, three, there was a preference for in-group serving bias versus out-group serving attributions for group differences, as we have found in pretty much all areas of social science. But we find a sort of trend, as we've seen before, that it's not so much that I hate everyone who's not one of us, I just like those in my group, and I distrust or want to disassociate from those who aren't involved in my in-group. Now, it can, I think, potentially devolve into this sort of behavior, it just sort of acts as a stepping stone towards it. I should note that none of the studies assessed at the time either sought to identify nor found an existence for the quote exceptional case effect that Pettigrew positive. There was some evidence, but the idea that anyone on the out group who does good is just some kind of noble savage essentially was not really identified. Thus, while not every aspect of Pettigrew's research received empirical support, it does seem that there's a propensity, if not even a proclivity, to experience the FAE in regards to outgroups, and to have reduced sense of FAE when it comes to our shared in-groups. That essentially means that we are more likely to perceive outgroup members as more incompetent and in-group members, when they fail, just as 
products of unavoidable accidents or twists of fate. Unlike some other theories, I can't so easily point toward any particular personality traits that are seemingly more or less related to the FAE. In fact, it was a topic that was mentioned as far back in this review in 1981 by Harvey Town and Yarkin, who argued that the FAE is not so much based on personality differences, but rather on purely circumstantial differences. And that seems to be supported by much of the data that we've looked at. In other words, were the tides turned, we might see a lot of the same kind of aggressive, reactant behavior and screeching from the right if they felt it was coming from an outside leftist source. However, outside of some kind of dork-sided stuff, I haven't seen a lot of that of late, or really in a very long time. As I said, I have a clip from just last year that shows a gun owner in a very similar position as this man at the vape shop being pretty level-headed. We could potentially call this back to the connection between Machiavellianism and cynicism, which seems to potentially play a large part in more trait-like propensity for the FAE. Although it seems there is a strong state-level influence when it comes to this phenomenon as well, it is possible there are trait-like elements that need to be examined in more detail. So, on that idea of ultimate attribution error regarding group perceptions, let's see if there's any more modern evidence for it. I mean, I cited a review of the literature published in 1990, which is the year I was born. If there has been nothing since then, it must not be a very robust theory then, right? Well, let's look at some more recent stuff. In confirmation of what we've seen, Khan and Liu 2008 looked at Muslims and Hindus to see if they could identify the ultimate attribution error, and found that negative perceptions related to outgroups being dispositional in nature was not supported. Instead, what they did find was that positive outgroup behavior was more commonly seen as a product of external circumstances or sources. That is essentially the exception to the rule effect that Pettigrew referred to and proposed that we didn't find in the 1990 overview and meta-analysis. In other words, if Muslims were nice, then it wasn't because they were Muslim or some aspect of their personality, but it's because they had some reason to be nice. Further, Coleman, 2013, looked at specifically Republicans and Democrats, hey, something we are usually talking about here on this channel, to see if they would perceive the outgroup as particularly negative, and instead found that, much as with the above, it was less about seeing the outgroup as hateful and more about seeing the in-group as desirable with decreased perceptions of anger and fear in regards to a stimulus describing negative traits about members of a shared in-group of the same political party affiliation. I'm not sure if these data would be replicated today. I honestly think that they should redo this study because the left is just so vitriolic right now. I really doubt if this would be the case, and I wouldn't say it's just the left. Everyone's kind of hypertense right now. So I'd like to see this study conducted again. But generally speaking, these data we have indicate that while we all experience the FAE, we seem to experience it less when it comes to those to whom we share an in-group, rather than, in contrast, having these great feelings of disgust and hatred towards the out-group. We all are going to experience some FAE when it comes to out-group members. It's more that we don't experience it so much when it comes to in-group members. Some of the problems in really identifying the FAE anymore likely arise in that it can be delineated into a bunch of more specific variables, including self-enhancing behavior. Self-enhancing behavior, as proposed by Kruger in 1998, is simply the tendency to view oneself as better than others from a socially normative perspective. This is not unreasonable, as no one wants to be the bad guy. We always view ourselves as the hero of our own stories, right? This is it. But it often doesn't represent reality. Rarely represents reality, I should say. An interesting way we can connect SEB to FAE is found in the work of Manley Russell and Buckley 2001, who reported on the aspect of accountability, that being the potential for being called out on your bullcrap, and found, very similarly to the work of Tetlock, that as anonymity decreased and propensity for accountability increased, people were less likely to engage in unethical behavior. Just like perceptions of another as being flawed was increased when there was no personal accountability ascribed to it. People are similarly more likely to act unethically when they think they won't face any kind of social repercussions. And right now, it's pretty rare for anyone on the left to really face any social, political, economic, and so on repercussions for acting like this. Oh. 
although reports seem to confirm that this lad has lost his job following his really stellar performance, it's a bit of an extreme example. I would ask, what now isn't an extreme example, given the current state of our society? Did this guy not have a good reason for behaving the way that he did, thinking that he could get away with it, given our cultural norms right now? I mean, after all, Lindsay Shepard, the graduate teaching assistant who was denigrated and brought to tears with threats of losing her position, which, by the way, she inevitably did at Wilfrid Laurier University simply because she played a clip of the great Satan Jordan Clean up your room. Peterson has now been sued for recording her own professors in their horrid anti-intellectual behavior. They're suing her now. Can you blame then this guy for thinking that he would be able to get away with it? I mean, really, doesn't all the evidence support the fact that he could just treat someone else like absolute garbage because he's in the wrong? He's the devil? He's evil? He is fundamentally flawed? This guy likely thinks, based on statements made, by the way, from major political leaders like Hillary Clinton, who says there is no potential or possibility for discourse with the right. That you cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. Where's the civility, Hillary. You want them? Civility, Hillary. Bernie says you're good for it. To Maxine Waters going out and saying, attack conservatives where you find them, be it in a restaurant or a vape shop, trying to just blow some fat clouds. Can you really not understand why this guy thinks he would not be held accountable for his actions? He obviously thought he would get away with this. Not only get away with it, he thinks in his head, he's in the right. His disposition is correct. The other guy is a jerk in his perception. On top of that, and on top of everything else we've learned about the FAE, well, it looks like there might just be an aspect of self-enhancing behavior and accountability perception here as well. It's also interesting to note from the Manly et al. data that marketing majors were significantly more likely to engage in potentially illegal or inappropriate activity when they did not believe they would be caught in comparison to accounting majors. And accounting and economics majors are, well, according to All Good 2012, generally considerably more conservative than many of their peers in other majors. Thus, it may be that more left-leaning people, either be in circumstance, such as we have the current social zeitgeist, or be the fact that they are more likely to go into things like marketing, based on what we've seen, are potentially more trait or state-based, likely to engage in this kind of behavior, thinking that they can get away with it. Speaking as somebody who majored in PR and minored in marketing, <laughs> I don't think so personally, but, but I'm obviously a bit of the odd man out here. There are also scientists who argue that proposing any type of dispositional nature related to the experiences of FAE to be fundamentally flawed, and suggest that FAE as a theory be replaced with more situational level explanations. Although I would argue that FAE researchers not only accept that there are situational elements that are involved in the FAE, but that FAE in and of itself is in no way at odds with situational claims. However, Garonsky 2004 posits that we should refer to this as correspondence bias rather than fundamental attribution error, given that it only appears to occur based on situational differences, as of much of the research I've provided to you here today has illustrated, with many of the effects of FAE being present only when an individual choice was absent in circumstantial situations and not across group differences. I would argue that I see FAE and correspondence bias as somewhat different concepts, but this is a legitimate criticism of the theory given how much evidence indicates a situational level basis for much, if not all, of what we call fundamental attribution error. As to why I think the FAE is not entirely situational, it's because outside of what we've discussed, there is some evidence for other social differences, even if we don't have much regarding personality differences. Let me point some of this out before I get into it, that even contending such a thing produced a published academic correspondence that puts some of the other academic rap battles I've ever seen to shame. Woo-wee! Look at this, lads. This is a real spicy boyo. If you've got a bunch of time to waste, guys, I cannot more highly recommend a great academic verbal slap fight than that between Polly and Rolf Gardner in various issues of Nurse Education Today. 
Dang. By academic standards, this is some yipes tier trash talk. Get your shit spit on, bitch! Watch this bitch! One more! One more to the bell ring! One more to the fuck out of here! Absolutely rude! And I love it. Anyway, getting away from my absolute love of researchers trash talking each other, it seems there is some evidence of group differences in propensity towards the FAE, which is separate from self enhancing behavior that Dr. Haley gets particularly riled up over in his um, really delicious sort of back and forth here. Uh, dang, sorry, I said I wasn't going to talk about it too much, but they are seriously some of the snarkiest, rudest, most condescending articles I have ever seen published, and it made my year. 2018 was happy for me because I came across these articles. <laughs> but it's also just kind of hilarious that the big debate about whether or not people believe others are influenced by disposition rather than situation is mostly comprised at this point of people arguing whether or not any of this behavior itself is based on situational evidence. Sorry, keep it together, Aiden. <sighs> keep it together, keep it together. Anyway. My point is that we can see group differences propensity towards perceptions of internal distribution attribution versus external distribution of attribution. Basically, whether it's your fault or the fault of the environment. While I need to be fair, no such difference was found by Kroll et al. in 1999 in propensity to overestimate dispositional attribution across Americans and Chinese students. There's still a lot of work that just needs to be done here. I scoured a lot of research databases to try and find some trait-like stuff or some more group-related stuff, and I just really couldn't find much. It's a dearth of data that we just need more information on. But in contrast, we do have Lee et al. 2012, who looked at Protestant and Catholic people in an attempt to isolate distinctive and discriminative cultural differences across even people of a highly similar general religious and ethnic group, and did isolate variants. Participants read a vignette about a character who behaved morally, a doctor donating medicine to disadvantaged children, or immorally, a politician who took bribes and then asked them about the extent to which they believe the character was in control of his or her own actions. They found that Protestants were more likely than Catholics to attribute some element of the character to the story as an inherent facet to their person rather than to their environment, which they expressed to a similar degree as Catholics. In other words, Catholics thought that environment and personality were about equally responsible, while Protestants believed that disposition was uniquely responsible for this person's behavior, be it good or bad. This effect, this effect was present even when the researchers accounted and controlled for potentially confounding variables such as Protestant work ethic. The point of all of this is that we are all subject to fundamental attribution we seem to be from all the data we've looked at. Or similarly, self-serving bias or correspondence bias, whatever you want to call it, based on your perception of how much of this phenomena is trait-like and how much of it is state-like. But whether or not you believe it's all state or all trait or somewhere in the middle, and pro tip, it's probably somewhere in between, just guessing, most things are, we are all capable and guilty of the fundamental attribution error, sometimes in some situations. When you see people absolutely losing their minds like this, it kind of makes sense. They see the other person on the other side of the counter as the enemy as someone who is intrinsically evil, who needs to be taken down because there is something about their person that is so awful that it is repugnant. And don't just take my word for it, they'll tell you that themselves. He's wearing some Trump, he's wearing some Trump bullshit, got some racist bullshit off in his head and shit. I already, I don't fucking, I'm not serving anyone that has to do with that fucker. I'm now, maybe this is really just a social group difference. But right now, we just need more research to fully express and explore this concept. And maybe it's just a situational bunch of elements, so adamantly supported by Dr. Paley in his nerd fight, which would make sense given the current state of the US culture on the left being predominantly in control. And despite being predominantly in control, with a monopoly of corporate media messages, social media, and the Silicon Valley, people on the left often express feeling disenfranchised and discriminated against. That's kind of part of their basis. And therefore we go back to the research and support for the ultimate attribution error. People who feel discriminated against are a little bit more prone to this potentially. Maybe not even hating the outgroups so much, but viewing their in-groups as incapable of flaw. And when you start to put these into a bit of a 
pressure cooker, we might be looking at what we see here today. It does not so much become that in-group good, out-group bad. Everyone who is not part of my group, and that doesn't mean all out-groups, it means anyone who is not specifically aligned with me all times, right now, every second, is bad. I think that might be what we're looking at here, but again, we need more research. If we go back once again to moral foundations theory, something I've spoken about a lot, more left-leaning people tend to value fairness and caring for others, while more right-leaning people tend to value purity and authority. And when your main moral concerns are things like perceived justness and equality of outcome, it makes sense why meritocracy is seemingly such anathema. That guy shouldn't have his job. He said something that you perceived of as offensive. Doesn't matter if he actually said it, it offended you. And that's all that matters. His hard work does not. This ma'am and this lad feel something about the other person is unfair or unjust. And according to the FAE, which we are again all equally prone to commit, illustrates why these individuals may become so irate. Because they believe the person simply wearing a shirt or potentially just misspeaking is somehow fundamentally wrong as a human being. Ironically, this is not fair, <laughs> as the left is so concerned with fairness. But what is fair is, as I've said, we're all equally susceptible to this error. It just seems to be a bit more prevalent across the left right now, be this trait-like or state-like or somewhere in between. Again, probably somewhere in between. It's up to you to make up your own interpretation, and it's why we need more research on the fundamental attribution era, on self-serving bias and on correspondence bias to definitively identify if there are personal or group differences here. Because right now it seems a little bit spurious on whether or not there are. We really just don't have enough data to make definitive statements on this. Dr. Paley, good sir, you have to know that we don't. Please don't write a paper about this video and burn me the way you burned them. I've got a martini glass here and it's highly flammable. So yes, I can't give you a really good reason as to why these people are acting the way that they are with a single theory. I've spoken a lot about this over the last two years in my stint on YouTube on trying to understand and explain what's going on in the left, why they seem so angry all the time. I've provided a couple of explanations, but here's a new one. Fundamental attribution error. Again, although we all are prone and guilty of potentially engaging in this error, it seems right now to be falling kind of heavily on the left. Once again, that does not mean that the right is not incapable of it. We all are. I have mentioned, though, as well, threat to identity and face threat in previous videos, but we've never covered attribution error. And I think it may provide some potential more explanation to the incredible complexity that is our cultural, political milieu particularly in regards to American politics and the extreme hatred towards Donald Trump and the animosity towards his supporters. This is kind of the second video that I've made in a row that I talk about theories that are a bit dated, even decades old, theories that have at one point been considered nigh unquestionable and ubiquitous, which have sort of fallen by the wayside, but from my perspective, need a little bit more of an invigoration within them because I think that they're still valuable theories with a lot of support behind them. I think this is a good theory that needs more support. So let's get a hashtag going, lads. That'll really work. Hashtag save the theories. Let's get it trending. Uh, yeah, good luck. All jokes aside and in summary, it seems that there might be a psychological reason for this kind of behavior outside of just mental illness, which I know seems to be the obvious conclusion when you look to someone screeching like this, that they're just insane. The videos I've shown you today do not seem like normal, healthy people. However, given the ubiquity of this kind of behavior, I think we really are looking at a trend of society and communication rather than an exception to the norm via some kind of mental illness. Do you think that this behavior is a manifestation of fundamental attribution error, as I've described in today's video? Or is it just insanity? Or is it something else? Is it face threat or one of the other theories that I've used to describe the left in the past? I don't know. Maybe it's a combination of all of these. When I see more than a few examples, though, I start to think about it statistically. And that's why I personally look for theoretical frameworks to try and explain what I see happening. And considering that these two videos came out within about a day of each other, uh, that would count enough as a trend for me to start to look at statistically. But what's your take, dear viewer? What do you think is really going on here? If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altana Volt. Also here at the end, I want to give a very, very special thank you to all of my patrons. You guys know I hate shelling, 
but I have to say thank you guys so much for sticking this out and thank you for the last two amazing years. I also think because it's the new year and as I was given a little bit of an idea from a certain wizard <laughs> that I should uh, shout out some channels that I think are a little bit clinically undersubbed. So here are some people that I would suggest you guys check out and if you're not into their content, you're not, but if you are, you are. I would say NC Clark, Cecil McFly, Adonis Paul, The Right Opinion. He's not maybe clinically undersubbed, but is a really great content creator. And along with him, I would also recommend Rags. And on that note, uh, my good friend Naka Levy. I play Pathfinder with him and several other people, usually once a week, although it's been a little off lately. That's been my fault. Uh, Hype Break, which is Ian Miles Chong's channel. Please check that out. Of course, I have to shout out ER, even though he's also... Not really undersubbed, but uh, sub to ER just like you subbed to PewDiePie. I'd also say if you're not subbed to Mauler, he does amazing video essays. Check him out. Also, my good friend Doc Griffin. He has incredible interviews with people. And also, if you're ever awake at four in the morning and want to listen to a podcast, he's online almost every day. Check out Doc Griffin. I also Appabend, who was on with me very recently in a live show. Please check him out. Porcelain, who does interesting sort of video essays on uh, certain members of the Opie and Anthony show. I would also say my good friend Mitch, of whom I constantly steal memes. Please also really check out Weekend Warrior. He does these great, great video essays on video games, particularly his Mass Effect videos have been fantastic. Uh, Tyro Incoate is a person that is often on Doc Griffin's show. Check him out. And also, Merck has asked me to shout out Burger Krieg, whose work I have not watched, but he says is very good, so trust him. And both of us want to say a very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to Short Fat Otaku, another channel where he does produce really good work and is undersubbed. So, I hope you guys have enjoyed this, and please, have a very, very Happy New Year. Whether the difference you see in the mirror means something inside to you or whether that's something that's a label that's been put on being black. It's what those who think no, and function does, as human it, no, beings. It does in a, establishing truth and no. fact as to whether or not Negroes are different from anybody else. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Sandy, Sandy, that's biology, different. Sandy, biology doesn't mean a thing. It really doesn't. It's what people believe. It's not what's true. It's what people think. I mean,